when a murder is discovered. It was right on the sidewalk where the shooting had occurred. So the shot came across three lanes of traffic as the car was in motion. It doesn't just destroy one life. I couldn't understand why. Why would somebody do such a terrible thing? It tears communities apart. You can still speak to residents now, and they say they've never got over it or what happened to a young man in the midst of their little community here. It's up to the police to not only solve the mystery. That was our hope, that where we were going was going to provide us with a treasure chest of information. And track down the killer, but bring them to justice. The absence of a head or hands in an investigation like this can impede identification, but it certainly doesn't make it impossible. In this episode, two teenage girls are attacked and killed in the same area, two years apart, in a case that changed policing forever. It was the biggest advancement in crime detection since the invention of fingerprinting a century earlier. Meet the murder detectives. When I arrived at the scene, I mean, the first thing I went and saw was the body in the wood. She'd clearly been attacked and strangled and raped. Every male of a certain age, you looked at them and thought, was it you? Who reveal how they caught the killer. Retired doctors, phlebotomists, local nurses, anybody that was qualified to take blood. Yes, there was a queue at the door. In the Leicestershire countryside lies the picturesque village of Narborough. On the 22nd of November 1983, police were called when a gruesome discovery was made. I became involved in the case on the Tuesday morning when I received a call to say that a body had been found on a footpath at Narborough. David Baker was made the senior investigating officer on the case. Well, they told me that an ambulance driver was on his way to work on his bike when uh, he went down a footpath known as the Black Pad and he'd seen a body in a copse by the side of the uh, footpath. So I immediately notified forensic teams and other detectives and went to the scene. The previous night, a local 15-year-old Linda Mann had been reported missing by her parents. Journalist Alan Thompson followed the story. She'd been reported missing by her mum the morning after she'd been out all night. Her and Linda's sister had grown concerned because she hadn't come home and contacted the police pretty much straight away. Aware that Linda was still missing, it was important for David and the police to identify the girl who had been found as soon as possible. When I arrived at the scene, I mean, the first thing I went and saw was the body in the wood. This was a open area with a wooden gate, which was very dilapidated, and she'd been dragged through there and then down the wood. She'd clearly been attacked and strangled and raped, and that was evident from the scene. David quickly made the connection with the missing teenager. We immediately contacted the relatives, and an officer was stationed with them whilst we were making inquiries at the scene. The police weren't the only people to arrive at the footpath in Narborough. The commotion soon attracted a crowd. There was quite a lot of press around within a very short space of time, really. Mostly local at that stage, because a murder in itself in a county like Leicestershire was not hugely significant unless it had a particular element to it. Because obviously there was a lot of forensic stuff to be done, so we weren't allowed to be very close to it. We obviously did a forensic examination in the cops here, and then uh, the body was removed to the mortuary for further examination. News of the shocking discovery soon spread to the whole village. 
I went to work and somebody said, have you heard the news and, uh, about a young girl being found? And I said, no, where? And they said, um, on the black pad. And I said, oh, when was that? And they said, she was found this morning. And I said, oh, God, we came by there last night. Well, obviously, it was a dreadful shock. I know everybody says you don't expect it to happen in your area, but you just don't. Narborough in 1983 and Enderby and the smaller settlement of Littlethorpe, there were dormitory villages. Uh, a lot of people work in Leicester, travelled in. But it was communities remarkable for being unremarkable, as it were. Narborough was a lot different to now. There weren't so many houses, there weren't so many people. Um, it was not exactly sleepy, but people mostly knew everybody. Around the early 80s, Leicestershire had a bit of a reputation for being a dumping ground for murder victims. So Leicestershire police had a lot on their hands. I'd got uh, five murders on at that time. In the area where Linda had been found, David and the team wanted to make sure they could gather all the evidence they could find. As a result of the examination at the scene, we preserved all the samples that we could and any that were loose and that before we removed the body and it was then taken to Leicester Royal Infirmary. They also had to examine the body for anything that might help find the killer. In a post-mortem, in cases of rape, there are a number of samples that would be taken. Blood samples would be taken, swabs would be taken. Clothing and other physical evidence would be collected, looking for things like hairs and fibres. So a real kind of minute investigation of small details that might be present. The fingernails may be scraped as well to look for evidence that may lie beneath those. We established at the post-mortem that she had been strangled and that uh, she had been raped severely. There was signs on the body of violence and also defence wounds. Linda's family were called to identify the body and confirm it was her. There was a lot of sympathy, certainly, for the family when Linda's name was known, largely from the people there with families of their own. Uh, it did kind of knit people together because mums would talk to mums about their daughters, what they were doing, sharing lifts, making sure they got home, whereas before they might have quite happily let them walk. With the community on edge, David and the team began to trace Linda's last movements in order to discover who might have seen her. We also established that around about the time the girl had left home, there was a scream heard by some residents in a nearby house to where the entrance of the footpath was. A friend of mine, when she and her sister were walking through the field where the murder supposedly took place, heard a scream and they'd got their grandchildren with them and the little boy ran off and he came back and said to his gran, I've just seen a, a girl and a boy in the field. She said, as we got closer, the man stood up and put his coat on. But we walked straight by, but the next day, we heard that a girl had been murdered in that field. Several people heard the scream, and the police were called. They took a description of the man seen in the area. It was fairly evident that the girl had not got very far from her home before she was attacked and dragged into the field where the footpath was. The police were beginning to get a clearer idea of what had happened on the night Linda was killed and set up an incident room. Linda lived on the estate behind me and she would have walked along this footpath to go straight ahead. See these buildings here? They were part of the hospital and we took them over as a incident room. And that's where we had the first incident room on the Linda Mann case. From this incident room, David set about searching for witnesses who may have seen Linda. We set out our inquiries into the villages with house-to-house -house inquiries in Narborough and Enderby. 
so we had a wide area to cover looking for potential suspects. With a 15-year-old girl strangled and dumped in a ditch, we're talking about somebody who is a kind of borderline paraphilic individual with a need to dominate. This perpetrator was possibly a borderline paedophile. This was probably, you know, a happily married man living very locally. We brought officers into the area and they covered all of the houses in the villages of Enderby and Narborough. I mean, there was upwards of 50 or 60 officers initially, including the search team, who were, you know, for the next six months, knocking on doors, interviewing suspects. Such a large police presence in the village, again, attracted a lot of attention. Well, obviously, it was a big story, it was a massive story, it was a front page story. Our inquiries were quite disappointing because there was very little information came in about anybody seeing Linda after her leaving home. There was just this scream. So the information that we got in respect of Linda was, was very limited. With the police inquiry getting nowhere in the villages, the local people remained on edge, fearful of a killer in their midst. Every male of a certain age, you looked at them and thought, was it you? This crime affected the local community. As with many communities where these crimes take place, that people look to their own, and doors are closed, and people are kept indoors. This was a small village. This was incredibly intense. And that fear also starts to create suspicion because it's patently obvious that person is local and people will get suspicious and start pointing fingers and gossip may arise. Also, that fear keeps people off the streets, which means that there's fewer eyes of witnesses out there in case it happens again. David had used every possible resource to gain any information that might help catch the killer. We used the press. We put out a photograph of a police officer dressed as Linda, you know, those sort of things. But uh, we, we got no feedback about anybody that had seen the girl after she left her home. People wanted to hear it, not for salacious reasons, but they wanted to know as much as they could about the hunt for the killer and had he been caught, were there any arrests made? We had a lot of support from the people in the villages because they were concerned. Their daughters were out and about in the villages in the evenings and, uh, of course, it restricted their activities and, of course, raised concern with parents. And uh, they cooperated with us as much as they could. During the investigation, there was obviously a lot of suspects, but they were eliminated and alibied out, and we really didn't have a suspect who really came into the frame. One year on from Linda's death, her killer was still at large. The police themselves had started to wind down the investigation by the summer of 1984. Yeah, people were getting very scared. The, the people of Linda's age were becoming very wary. Their parents were becoming anxious, neurotic about their children's safety. It was not a good atmosphere at all. It was uh, people were worried, very worried. In 1983, a 15-year-old girl, Linda Mann, had been found murdered on a path between Leicestershire villages Narborough and Enderby. Police had been unable to track down the killer. Due to the lack of information coming in, uh, clearly the inquiry wound down and uh, it was left with probably half a dozen officers chasing up information and anything that came in. If we think back to the 1980s, there wasn't such things as CCTV. There wasn't the use of a mobile phone, so we didn't have that technology which we were able to use in an effective way during an investigation. But also, communities were very different then. They weren't as transient as they perhaps are today. So that in itself would have created some community tension because if somebody has been killed in their local area, then 
communities would think, well, actually, the killer is within our population. We didn't always have it in our minds, but those of us with girls, daughters, we were always aware, and I, I think we did behave differently. We took extra care, we wanted to know a bit more about where they were all the time. As the community began to relax, in the summer of 1986, another teenage girl was reported missing in the area. On Thursday the 31st of July in 1986, we received a report from Mrs Ashworth that her daughter had not returned home. Dawn had failed to return to her home in Enderby, which, given Linda's murder three years earlier, just took things to a new level in terms of the concern that was in the community and the horror that grew. Head of CID David Baker and his team immediately began a search of the area. This is the entrance to Ten Pound Lane, and this is where Dawn Ashworth was making her way back home, having visited a friend's house, which is on the opposite side of the main road. And of course, when she arrived there, they weren't in. And so she turned around and came back. We continued the search on the Friday, and on the Saturday, a dog handler was carrying out a further search near fields near to the motorway, and he came across a leather jacket, which was one of the parts of the clothing that uh, Dawn was wearing when she left home. He then carried out a further search of the field and discovered the body in a hedgerow. Dawn's body was in the hedge in the centre there, covered with hay and stinging nettles. The hay had been mown, but was left lying on the field. When um, Dawn's body was found, there was an air of disbelief about the place, about the community, among the police themselves, thinking they'd got a double killer on the loose, unofficially speaking, of course and it just blew everything up to a, to a different level. Linda was killed in November and it was the coldest night of the year and there was no attempt made to conceal the body. Dawn, in comparison, it was in the height of summer and uh, there was a distinct attempt to conceal the body by covering it with grass and nettles and what have you. I couldn't believe it had happened again. People were obviously saying, um, well, is it the same man? There were so many questions and no answers because people didn't know. Having that second homicide that detectives believe was, was connected to the first would have actually been helpful because now you've, in a sense, got two sets of crime scenes, you've got two victims' bodies, and the opportunity for forensic clues is increased, obviously but also opportunities to try and work out what suspects were in these areas at the right time. We became concerned when the body was found that there was a serial killer at large. Two girls missing in the same area, both strangled and brutally raped, and there were signs that the two offences were connected. With the second body, it becomes obvious that the perpetrator has to be a local man. It has to be someone who knows the area, someone who knows where it's safe to run, where it's not safe to run, and someone who knows when they're basically being able to intimidate somebody who is also local and make sure they never tell the tale. Once we heard about the second murder, we did act differently because the police didn't seem to have any idea of who it could be. So everybody was looking at everybody, especially the males of a certain age, because that's who the police were pinning their hopes on. Police were searching the vicinity and had set up a mobile incident room near to Dawn's home. Now one of the houses facing is where Dawn lived. Obviously, the family no longer live there now, but uh, that's where she started off her journey. And she would have walked down to the left, which we're going. 
a member of the public contacted the police to say they had found a motorbike abandoned near to where Dawn was found. Well, this is the place where the young man's motorcycle was found parked. He was nowhere to be seen in the vicinity. Local people were now reporting anyone they had seen acting suspiciously at the time of Dawn's murder. We received information that uh, a young man who lived the other side of the village of Enderby had been talking about the body being found in Ten Pound Lane. And we established that this was on the Friday before the body was found on the Saturday. And he significantly drew attention to himself. David and his team linked the motorbike and the youth and called him in for questioning. Within a month of Dawn's murder, in August 1986, a 17-year-old was pulled in by the police, and I remember going to a press conference where the then head of CID said they were 300% certain they'd got the killer. The reaction in the community when a local man was arrested and charged was one largely of relief. He was charged and held in custody and put before the next available court. His solicitor was present and we also obtained samples from him. The suspect was charged with the murder of Dawn Ashworth after blood tests showed he had the same blood group as samples found on the body. There was a great deal of confidence uh, in the police that they had their man. The head of CID, Dave Baker, an exceptionally careful man, approached his chief constable, despite the fact they had circumstantial evidence against the man. David wanted to prove beyond reasonable doubt that the suspect was their killer. He had heard that Dr Alec Jeffries at Leicester University had developed something called DNA fingerprinting that he was using for paternity testing. DNA profiling is commonly referred to as DNA fingerprinting because the characteristics that are assessed are thought to be unique, as in a fingerprint. I was aware of work done by Sir Alec Jeffrey in connection with DNA research, and it was a case of the blood group being down to the individual as opposed to a percentage of the population. David took the semen samples obtained from Linda and Dawn's bodies and established that both had the same DNA fingerprint present. This came back to me from Sir Alec, saying that one man was responsible for the murder of both girls. They then compared that to the DNA from the blood taken from their suspect. He was not a match. It was quite a blow for us to confirm that this young man was not the murderer of either girl. We're all subjected to stereotypes and sometimes somebody looks like a suspect when they really have absolutely nothing to do with it. I suppose they do have stereotypes of how people should act as suspects, as witnesses, as victims. And sometimes if you don't fit neatly into that box, then it might ring alarm bells for detectives. And sometimes that alarm bell system works well but at other times it can lead you down a path where you're actually accidentally implicating the wrong suspect. He was released from custody in November 1986. So he'd been in custody for two or three months, and although he'd made other admissions about other offences, these were not proceeded with in view of the time that he'd spent in custody. People couldn't believe it, but all of a sudden that comfort blanket was taken away again. They thought the police had got the man who was responsible, and now all of a sudden they hadn't. Their prime suspect had been cleared by the groundbreaking technology they had hoped would prove him guilty. But David and the team were still convinced DNA fingerprinting could be used to catch the killer. Dave Baker, the head of CID, had a, a great belief and trust in Alec Jeffries' technique and Alec Jeffries as a man decided that he needed to do a very extensive sampling of just over four and a half thousand men aged between 17 and 34 living in Enderby, Narborough and Littlethorpe to rule in or rule out those individuals. Leicestershire police were about to undertake something that had never been done before. DNA testing a whole community in the hope 
of catching a killer. In 1986, Leicestershire police had used the cutting-edge science of DNA fingerprinting to prove that the same person had killed teenagers Linda Mann and Dawn Ashworth, less than three years apart. After the second murder, of course, people's awareness was heightened even further than it had been uh, after Linda's murder to think there was two young girls now dead. I recall the police putting on more reassurance patrols, as they call them, having more of a visible presence in the village, as well as the detectives. Yeah, it did affect lives. Going back into 1980, murder investigations were much bigger than they perhaps are today. You know, the idea, I, I guess, was that the area would be swamped with police officers. The pure logistics of it would have been very challenging and very difficult. The police had arrested a man in connection with Dawn's murder, but DNA testing had proved he was not responsible. It was quite a blow for us to confirm that this young man was not the murderer of either girl. And of course, we had got to set out our investigation again, but with uh, more impetus bearing in fact that we knew that one man was responsible for both murders, so we'd got a serial killer out there and we firmly believed that he was still a local man. One of the ways in which DNA was critically important was eliminating an innocent suspect fairly early on in the investigation, a suspect who had, you know, implicated himself in one of those murders um, but was in fact completely innocent. And so it's equally powerful in, in um, eliminating innocent suspects as it is in implicating the guilty much of the time. We came to a conclusion in November that in order to take the inquiry further on, we should use the DNA and sample the community with a view to finding the individual who is responsible for these two murders. The police knew it wouldn't be popular in every quarter when they'd said they were going to take blood samples from every man between 17 and 34 who lived within the three villages. but working on the basis that most people within those communities would see it as a good thing because it would finally rule in or out a member of their community. The police planned to do blood testing in all three villages near the murder sites. They were having officers put letters through people's door, but everybody was notified that every man of that age group, 17 to 34, was required to give a sample. We sent out letters to various members of the public with a request that they attend the particular session and they bring with them a photograph or passport or driving licence. And of course it was a sample of blood then, not just a smear or a, a mouth swab. It was a full-blooded sample. It was purely voluntary and of course the community realised the significance of what we were asking. This is the first instance where this mass profiling was actually implemented um, across a very large number of people. This would have taken a huge amount of time, not only to collect the samples themselves, but also to, to process the samples. Now, in order to facilitate the blood sampling, we set up centres in the villages of Narva and Enderby. The blood testing centres were run by a local network of volunteers and were busy from the start. Retired doctors, phlebotomists, local nurses, anybody that was qualified to take blood. Yes, there was a queue at the door. I, th I think, by and large, there was support for it. It's hard not to support something that may end up catching the killer of two teenage girls. Alongside the blood tests, detectives were continuing to carry out door-to-door -door inquiries. The police came round to interview our son, um, who was at school. They said if they needed, they would come back. They spoke to my husband, but he was outside of the age range that they were testing at the time, so he didn't have to give blood. 
Men from across the region were all called to the testing centres to have blood taken in the hope of finding a match with the DNA found on the two murdered girls. People were looking at their neighbours, people they might not have been entirely sure about, but innocent of everything, but looking a bit strange. Yeah, there was a lot of unease, uncertainty, um, distrust, I think, growing, and, and sort of people wrapped their arms even more tightly around their children to stop them becoming the next victim. Yeah, it was, it was not a good time. The tests revealed that anyone who was not the same blood group as the killer was immediately in the clear. If there was a match, the blood was sent for DNA analysis. Now, red blood cells themselves don't actually contain any DNA. The DNA itself is housed within the white blood cells. This DNA can actually be used as a reference sample compared to samples from other origins. So it could be a blood sample compared to a semen sample, for example. We got results back in about three to four weeks. At those days, it wasn't a fast service. With the male population of three villages to test, they kept the mobile units running for as long as it needed to get a result. All their eggs were in one basket with the area that they were testing, and they had to brace themselves for the fact that they may not find the killer. In fact, there was 4,582 samples taken they'd finished without the killer having been caught. We were consistent with the blood sampling right through until August of uh, 1987. In one way, it's a very simple decision, isn't it? We're just going to take DNA for everybody. That's, that's the answer, and then we'll identify who's done it, which sounds really simple, but so challenging. So very, very challenging, and um, it was a brave decision. I would imagine a lot of thought went into that decision, but ultimately, if every other line of inquiry had come up negative, that's all you're left with, so that's all you're going to be able to do. David and his team had been taking blood samples for 10 months. So far, all of the tests they had completed were negative. It was then in August that we had a breakthrough and we realised that we'd got an individual who'd taken a blood sample for somebody else. A local woman contacted police to say she had some information she felt was important. She had uh, had a conversation with a man named Kelly, who said that he had taken a blood sample for a man named Pitchfork. Immediately, we checked our system and found that Pitchfork had, in fact, had an invitation to attend and ostensibly had attended and given blood. Of course, we then established that Pitchfork and Kelly were very much suspect to our inquiry. The man who had asked Kelly to take his blood test for him was local cake decorator Colin Pitchfork, who lived in Littlethorpe. This general area is where Pitchfork bought his house and was living at the time of the two murders. Pitchfork would never have popped up on anybody's radar. A wife who knew nothing of what he was doing, two small children. I believe she announced the night he came back from killing either Linda or Dawn, due now she was pregnant with their second child. Police quickly moved in to track down these two men. We immediately did background enquiries on both Kelly and Pitchfork, and within 24 hours, they had both been arrested, and as a result of that, were taken to the police station and questioned, and both admitted they had conspired in this blood sampling. Pitchfork's record showed that he had been a flasher, exposing himself to more than a 1,000 women. Kelly had no criminal record. Pitchfork, we established then, had convictions for indecent exposure. But they were as a juvenile. Exhibitionism is one of those anonymous sex crimes where you maintain um, distance from your um, victim. Basically, you want to fantasize, you want to impose your fantasy on the victim. They become whoever you want them to be. In the case of moving from exhibitionism to murder, that anonymity will still be there. They want to fantasize about this body, but they don't want to interact with it and reveal it to be an individual person. So there is absolute continuity between the exhibitionism seen earlier 
and the manner of the killings later. Pitchfork was the main concern when the information came through. I mean, he was the man that had had his blood given by somebody else. By avoiding giving blood, Pitchfork had become the prime suspect in this case. It looked like the police had found their killer. In order to track down the killer of two teenage girls, Linda Mann and Dawn Ashworth, police had been taking blood samples from most of the male population in the villages of Narborough, Littlethorpe and Enderby. No one living outside of the immediate area of those three communities was tested. When taking blood samples in the community, the police had asked men to prove their identity, but Colin Pitchfork, with the help of Ian Kelly, had somehow fooled the system. We knew from the outset that there would be people who would endeavour to mistake in the samples, and that was one of the reasons why we insisted on the passport or the driving licence. Kelly had shown Pitchfork's passport when he went to give blood, pretending to be him. Kelly gave a sort of lame excuse for taking the passport because he suggested that Pitchfork had already given blood for somebody else who was frightened of the needle. And so Pitchfork asked him to give blood for him. But it was rather a lame excuse. After the men were arrested, police seized the passport and discovered Ian Kelly's photograph had been pasted over that of Colin Pitchfork. Pitchfork was questioned about the murders of both Linda Mann and Dawn Ashworth. The interviews with Pitchfork were conducted by experienced officers who went through his actions at the time of both murders. We didn't know Pitchfork had been arrested until the police were absolutely sure, and there was no doubt. Given that the DNA testing was a brand new system, never before tried in a court of law, they needed to be not 300, but 3,000% sure that they got the right man before they announced it. They were desperate to announce it desperate to announce it, to show that their efforts had worked. In the interview room, Pitchfork admitted everything. At the time of the first murder of Linda Mann, it was on an evening when his wife had gone to a night school and he decided to have a ride round in his car and uh, see who he could see. Now, the only trouble was he'd got a young baby and so he put the baby in the car seat and drove round because he was in the process of buying a house at Littlethorpe. He was in the Littlethorpe Narborough area, and as he drove up the road, he saw Linda Mann walking in the same direction that he was going. So he went a little bit further up the road and parked his car at a offshoot of the hospital. He accosted Linda and dragged her into the area of the Black Path where he killed her. The perpetrator in this case was clearly an opportunist. He just waits for that occasion when someone is out on their own, uh, they fit his fantasy target, and he can't see any witnesses or the likelihood of any witnesses coming along. And then he's very efficient in general at targeting them, bringing them down, and having his way with the body, and then returning seamlessly to his everyday life with his son in the back of the car, who basically would be one of the best alibis you could have. The story Pitchfork told fitted the evidence police had found at the time of Linda's murder. Pitchfork went on to describe the night he killed Dawn. As far as Dawn was concerned, he was on his way home from work to Littlethorpe, and as he drove along the main Narborough Road, he saw Dawn cross the road and walk up 10 pound lane. He parked his car and followed her, and that's where he attacked her and killed her. He didn't actually admit a motive, but I mean, clearly his motivation was of a sexual nature. 
I think some of the reasons why some murderers never tell detectives why they killed the victim, um, in some instances it's because they're still denying that they were responsible, of course, so they're not going to say why because they're, not, they're saying they didn't do it. But in those cases where they have ultimately confessed, I think they're either trying to control that piece of information, it's the one bit that they'll keep to themselves, perhaps they don't know, perhaps they genuinely aren't certain what their motivations were. It was a complex mix of, of different sorts of emotions and they can't articulate it clearly even in their own minds. After almost four years and thousands of blood tests, the police had finally found their killer. Colin Pitchfork was charged with the murders of both Dawn Ashworth and Linda Mann. Pitchfork was charged at court with four offences. One was an indecent assault on a 15, 16 year old girl before the murder of Linda Mann. Then before the murder of Dawn Ashworth, he'd also accosted another girl and take her in his car, but she managed to escape. But that was in a, an area away from Narborough and Enderby. Well, he was able to come back to reality, if you like, and show no other indications of his condition. You know, his behavior was the norm for a psychopath. The man who had taken the blood test for Pitchfork, Ian Kelly, was charged with conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. Both men faced trial at Leicester Crown Court. The trial of Colin Pitchfork began in January 1988, and he admitted both murders, which at least spared the family's hearing through the probably gruesome police evidence that there would be surrounding the discovery of their girls' bodies. The plea of Pitchfork was actually guilty, so the DNA evidence itself was never actually presented in court. If he hadn't admitted it, his DNA would have proved his guilt anyway, because we did a blood test on his sample, and of course, that came up positive in the murder of both girls. So, I mean, the result was inevitable. Ian Kelly also admitted his part in aiding Pitchfork in attempting to cover up his crimes. Kelly was sentenced to 18 months imprisonment for conspiracy to prevent the course of justice. Pitchfork admitted the murders of the two girls. He was given life sentences for each of their murders. He was given 10 year sentences for rape, a shorter sentence for perverting the course of justice by having someone else take the test for him. David and the team had successfully caught their killer, but inadvertently, they had also changed the way all future murders would be investigated. It was incredible because it was such a breakthrough in criminal investigation, which had been brought about by two of the quietest, most modest individuals you would ever have come across. Alec Jeffries, such a self-deprecating man. David Baker, a highly intelligent investigator of crime. And together, they developed an enormous respect for one another that brought this huge breakthrough in the world of criminal investigation. It's quite a remarkable story in the Colin Pitchfork case that the detective happened to have read about something that was happening in his local university that was being developed around DNA that, of course, wasn't really and hadn't at that stage been used in a criminal investigation. It was being used more for paternity testing. But they had the idea that perhaps something could come of this and together those two individuals, the scientist and the detective, you know, made huge use of, of something that became critical evidence in that case, of course. There was quite a, a sort of slow burn reaction to the news that this technique had worked because nobody could quite believe it. It was the biggest advancement in crime detection since the invention of fingerprinting a century earlier. But it didn't bring back the girls, but it stopped him maybe moving on to any others. It was a great relief when Pitchfork was caught. It was a relief for many people, including the family, the community, and of course the officers that had worked on the inquiry. The girls would now have been lower end of middle-aged women, probably with their own children, possibly with grandchildren. Everybody who was in that same age group, in that position, I'm not saying they'll think of them every day, but there will be times when they will cast their thoughts back. I don't think the community will ever forget 